Es un placer darles la bienvenida a Barcelona y agradecerles su participación en la primera edición del Smart Mobility World Congress. Hoy tenemos entre nosotros dos keynotes de excepción en el mundo de la movilidad que nos presentarán una visión del futuro desde dos ópticas muy distintas. Por un lado, un proyecto rupturista impulsado por la empresa Hyperloop que persigue implantar un nuevo modo de transporte consiguiendo desplazamientos de personas a más de 1.000 km por hora mediante un cambio radical respecto a los sistemas actuales de transporte. Por otro lado, la innovación aplicada a la gestión de un modo de transporte tradicional con más de 150 años de historia, Transport for London, es una de las mayores autoridades del transporte del mundo que tiene bajo su responsabilidad el facilitar la movilidad a más de 31 millones de viajeros al día en el área del Gran Londres. El señor Dick Albon es el CEO de una empresa visionaria como es Hyperloop, Transportation Technology, que es seguramente, ya han leído, una de las empresas que están más en la prensa hoy en día. El señor Sashi Berma es el director de la Oficina de Tecnología y Experiencia del Viajero de Transport for London. Es un organismo que desde la implantación de la tarjeta Oyster, conocida por todos ustedes cuando viajan a Londres, ha marcado tendencias en adaptar los sistemas y tecnologías tarifarios al cliente del siglo XXI. Sin más dilatación, eh, doy la palabra a los protagonistas de esta sesión. Gracias. All right, good morning. So my name is Dirk Alborn. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. And we say that we transform transportation at the speed of sound. This doesn't work. There you go. All right. So what is Hyperloop? Who here actually knows what Hyperloop really is? I'll test you guys later. So for everybody else, we have a little video that gives a little bit an in, uh, introduction. So enjoy. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. Imagine a capsule filled with people, right? You put this capsule inside the tube. You create a low pressure environment inside the tube. So you have no resistance. And it's moving very fast from point A to point B. A capsule very similar to an airplane that goes in high altitudes uh, can travel really fast with very little energy. Is, is the main trick to it uh, the vacuum and the fact that there's no friction? Is that the, the main reason yeah. why it makes it so fast? Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. So when Elon published the document, he just drafted a possible way to achieve this. Two months later, my business partner, Dirk Alborn, took this document, published in our website, the Jumpstart Found, and did a call to action. So, how are we doing this? We want you all to join the Hyperloop movement. And we have been like overwhelmed of requests from engineers from all over the planet. Mm. Uh, there were people from, you know, NASA, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, yeah. Boeing, MIT. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. So we are creating the biggest crowdsourcing project in the planet. The company says it already has several potential investors and wants to take Hyperloop to China in the future. You have to consider that the Hyperloop is not a new idea. Uh, humanity tried to build this system several times in the past. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods known as the Hyperloop is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5. We designed a system that is not only fast, but it can actually produce more energy than it consumes. It will change the way we live. It's possible today, it's based on existing technologies, and it's the right time, it's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. In 30 years time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. 
All right. So those were a couple of, uh, well, the first couple of years put together in a couple of minutes. So just to reiterate, what is a Hyperloop? Imagine a capsule similar to an airplane fuselage filled with people or freight hovering inside a tube and moving really, really fast from one point to the other. Actually, it moves right below the speed of sound. Inside this tube, we create a low pressure environment. So basically, we have vacuum pumps along the tracks that take the air out, so that now the capsule can go much faster with much less energy because it doesn't encounter any resistance anymore. The whole system is completely green, so using alternative energy. We're using solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and depending on the climate, even geothermal, to ideally, well, depending on the route, of course, produce more energy than we're actually using. Sorry, this is, oops. But why? Why should we care about what they call the fifth mode of transportation. This is why. Traffic. We spend a lot of time in traffic. A lot of time that, well, we could be productive, or maybe even more important, we could be with the people we care about. Traffic is one of the biggest problems that we have. Traffic is so important that based on where we live, we decide where we work, right? Actually, where I come from, in Los Angeles, based on where you live, there you go, well, you decide who you date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it's not gonna work out. And then we have this, Beijing on a sunny day. On a bad day, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So most people think that this is an issue that you have in China or in India, but in real, even here in Europe, you're losing on average 15 months of your life thanks to pollution. So now of course, transportation is only part of that, but it's important enough for governments to now move over into green modes of transportation. Just jump this one, let's go. Sorry. Well, and then we have the railroad industries. They're literally a dinosaur industry. They haven't changed much. They're still the same like they used to be 100 years ago, basically. These are normal railroad tracks. The distance between those tracks is one meter 43.5. Senator Gorge. That's how, in most, or, uh, most part of Europe, we're building new infrastructure. Spain actually was very smart and went a, bit, a little bit larger. But this is where most parts in the world, they build it this way. Anybody here know why? Why is that distance? This is why, the Roman carriage. So basically, in 2017, we're building new infrastructure based on the butt of two horses. That's how much innovation we have done in the rail industry. And then it comes to cost, profitability. Actually, there's no rail line, no metro line in the whole world that's profitable. This is an example of the Los Angeles Metro. The Los Angeles Metro makes 76 cents per passenger and $2.50 are coming from taxpayer money. Now, of course, you might want to say it's Los Angeles and uh, everybody takes a car, that's why you're all standing in traffic, and that's true. But even New York, which is probably one of the most used metros in the world, loses 82 cents per passenger, which comes out to $2.2 billion every year. Germany subsidizes their ne rail network with roughly 22 billion euros every single year. So the Hyperloop, because of our low operational cost, can actually be profitable in a very short time span. All the routes that we have been looking up to is, are roughly around 8 to 15 years. 
So how would our lives change if we would have a Hyperloop? Well, another problem we're having are airports. We're building more and more of them. They're overflowing, right? So with a Hyperloop, we can now connect these airports and they would become actually terminals, one big airport. Or we can build them much further out and still be there within minutes. When we talk about freight, we can have goods coming from China into Europe within hours rather than within weeks, literally enabling an on-demand economy. But most people get excited about living in one place and working in another. You can live in a satellite city, 150, 200 kilometers outside of the city, buy a much cheaper house, and still be within minutes in the city center and enjoy all the amenities that you have here. All right, how are we doing this? So when we looked at to the feasibility of the system, we looked at the technical feasibility. And it turns out the technology already exists. We know how to build pylons, build tubes. We know how to create a vacuum inside a tube. So this is actually a picture of the CERN Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And the vacuum inside those tubes is 100,000 times more difficult to maintain than the one that we are using. And the company responsible for that vacuum is actually part of our team, Leibold Vacuum. Alternative energy is a safe bet. It's getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper every single year. So today, in California, for example, we're capable of um, covering our complete energy cost just with solar, with the latest solar technology. But we know tomorrow that's going to be cheaper and even better. But we're doing something else in a completely different way. We're building a company in a completely different way. So normally when you talk about a train or a metro, this is where it's happening, behind closed doors. You hear they're planning something, Maybe you hear how much it's going to cost, but that's it. You can't really participate. We do something that we call crowdstorming. And with crowdstorming, what we really do is we question everything. So you see, we have one big advantage. There is no hyperloop. There are no regulations. We have to create a completely new. We don't have legacy issues. So we can question everything. Things like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the right way to monetize? Because if I can find a way to make more money the more the passenger rides, then a ticket becomes negative. Then I use a ticket only to regulate demand. Think about transportation as a marketing, and I actually monetize on the time the passenger spends inside the vehicle. Or if I look at our business plan and I see that we're spending billions of dollars for pylons. You can just ask the question, here, I give you 200 pylons, they're yours. What are you going to do with them? And it's only asking that question that really gets you amazing ideas. Some are crazy, some are amazing, but it really brings them forward. From things like, let's make them into beehives to let's use them as vertical gardens or electric car charging stations. And it's exactly that. It's just questioning everything. I think that everybody here who takes a train, takes a bus, takes a taxi, knows that you can do those things better. We can have a better passenger experience while the transportation company actually generates income rather than using taxpayer money. Part of that are our virtual windows. You see, we have a problem inside the Hyperloop. We don't have windows because we're inside a tube. So we're developing a technology that uses normal screens and we're using head tracking to simulate a window. So when you're looking, when you're moving your head, it sees where you're looking and it shows you with a parallax, uh, in a parallax way how it might look outside. So now, 
Imagine going through Jurassic World, Terminator Land, Game of Thrones. For you, it's an experience, but for the transportation company, it's actually a way of generating income. So we're working with several entertainment companies on the content here already. All right, why? Why are we working like this? Well, turns out the idea of the Hyperloop is actually not new. It has been around for quite some time. Most people think of Elon Musk, but the idea has been around much, much longer, for hundreds of years. One of the first attempts was in New York, for example, already in 1870. And they built a station and built a track for traveling inside a tube. They wanted to connect New York to San Francisco. And in case you wonder, they didn't make it. But they tried. The first patent for a train inside a vacuum was as early as 1904. So, and there have been many, many others afterwards. So when we looked at why these didn't succeed, we realized that they were always depending on one company, on one government. So we realized we had to do something a little bit different. We had to do more than just build a company. We had to build a movement. And that's exactly what it is today. We have almost 900 people all around the world, most of them working in exchange for stock options. We have a community of over 60,000 people that crowdstorm with us and over 40 companies that are bringing their technologies and their knowledge in the same way in exchange for participation in the company into this project. You hear about the Hyperloop now everywhere. There are several companies, several universities. It's exactly that. It's a movement. We have offices in Los Angeles, in Barcelona, so right here, we're actually home in Bratislava, in Toulouse, where we're opening up our R&D center, and in Abu Dhabi. Some of the companies we partner with are literally the leading companies in their field. From Atkins, construction engineering, which is one of the leading construction engineering firms responsible for the metro in Dubai, to Caburis, Spanish manufacturer working for Airbus and Boeing and doing the cups of fuselages to Leibold, the inventor of the vacuum pump and many, many more. All right, but when? When are we going to see the first Hyperloop? That's probably the question that I get the most. People are always wondering, which is already good, because to be honest with you, at the beginning, we always heard, is this even possible? You can't do this. Now, we don't hear that anymore. We only hear when. So we have been quite busy over the last four years. We have been building technology, licensing technology. We have then done several contracts around the world with different governments, so that now, we're ready to build. So version number one is ready. There's going to be a version 168 one day. Of course, you can always become better. And um, well, we actually put into manufacturing our first, the fir world's first full-scale passenger capsule together with our partner Caburas here in Spain. The capsule is now being manufactured. It takes roughly a year, so the capsule will be ready by mid of next year. Then it will go to Toulouse for integration and assembly, before then going on the first commercial track, which we plan to announce over the next six months. So one of the biggest problems is not technology here. As I said earlier, the technology already exists. You could take a normal train, put this train into a very large tube, take the air out, and now it could go much faster with much less energy. But what we are doing is we're optimizing the system. We're selecting the right technologies so that it actually makes sense. But there is one big problem, and that is that this is, of course, a big endeavor. It's something that normally it's done by governments. It's done not just by a single company. 
So we need to create completely new regulations. It's not a train, it's not a plane, right? And you still need to make sure that all the people are safe. So we're working now with several governments around the world. In the Czech Republic, we're doing a feasibility study between Bratislava, Brno, and Prague. In Slovakia, we signed with the Slovakian government looking into a local system. In Toulouse, as I mentioned earlier, our R&D center. In California, we have a five-mile easement where we filed our building permits and are doing the environmental studies. In Indonesia, one of the most trafficked areas in the world, we're doing a feasibility study to figure out how it would influence Jakarta. In the Emirates, we're working together with the royal family. Actually, we have Sheikh Falah bin Zayed Al Nayan, the brother of the ruler of the Emirates, as our official partner in the company. And we just in the, we're just in the process of finishing the world's complete first feasibility study together with the government. In Korea, the government actually decided that they are going to be building the Hyperloop. So now from a movement, it's turning into an industry. And they have been creating an, uh, a consortium and we're working with this consortium to license our technology. And in India, we just announced very recently another feasibility study. So, we started four years ago with an idea. And today, you have, I'm sure most of you have heard about the Hyperloop by now. It's not an idea anymore, it's going to be happening. But most people doubt that you could do something like this. So this is kind of like the answer to all of those naysayers that at the beginning said, well, you can't be doing this. I believe that if someone tells you that you can't do something, it just means that they haven't figured it out. It doesn't mean that you can't figure it out. So, as I mentioned earlier, three years until you and me can write the Hyperloop, a little bit more until the regulations are going to be finished. And of course, you're all invited. Thank you. <laughs>